Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our X2 Caregiver Training Workshop. We're very excited that you've taken the time to join us this evening. My name is Tamika Norton-Brown, and I am the Project Coordinator for X2. I have with me Dr. Robert Glukop, and what I'm going to do is give him the opportunity to introduce himself, and then I will just give you some information on how we are going to conduct the workshop this evening. So, Dr. Glukop. Hi, I'm Rob Glukoff. It's a great pleasure to be with you this evening. We hope that this information, the information we're going to provide, will be useful, hopefully inspiring in some way. We thank you for, for joining us. Back to you, Tamika. Thank you so much, Dr. G. Um, as I said again, what we're going to do, he and I will be team doing the presentation this evening. So there are certain parts that I will be doing. There are certain parts that he will be doing. Um, we will be giving a um, overview of Dementia 101. I will be telling a little bit about my caregiver journey. We will be doing a relaxation exercise. So get ready for that. It's going to come toward the end. So hopefully it will be able to put you all to sleep. Um, we want you all to, but not going to sleep until after we're done though. Um, <laughs> we yeah. want you to be as interactive as possible. So we encourage you to share your questions and your comments. We will be taking pauses throughout so that you'll have the opportunity to make um, any comments or ask any questions that you may have about anything that we've covered. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we would like to thank our partners, the African Methodist Episcopal 11th Episcopal District, the Florida State Primitive Baptist Convention, the Progressive Missionary and Educational Baptist Convention of Florida, the Florida General Baptist Convention, and of course, the FSU College of Medicine. Um, I will issue the caveat that I issue every time we do one of these presentations. Yes, we have a slide presentation. For those of you who pre-registered, we emailed it to you earlier. There will also be a link to the presentation in the comments so that you can access um, the presentation while we are doing it. For my portion, I will say that I don't always stick to the slides. I will do the best that I can to follow the content. Um, but if I don't give everything word for word, just, just please charge it to my head and not to my heart. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is just tell you a little bit about my journey as having been a caregiver and a facilitator in the X2 program. Um, caregiving is something that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I had the wonderful privilege to serve as a caregiver for my aunt who ultimately died from complications from her dementia. Um, I will honestly say that it was one of the hardest things that I've done in my life, but it's nothing that I would go back and change. Um, there are many challenges that I faced in doing that, but I did have a great support system, my husband and other family members who were there for me. Um, I worked in this program while I was caregiving and did not always take advantage of the resources that were available to me. Um, I was raised in a rural community, very tight knit family. And we were just raised that what happens in our house stays in our house. And so I was not really open to seeking help from what I would say would be outsiders. There were many days where I came into work and would get a phone call and would have to leave and travel to go make sure that everything was okay with her. Um, it was very stressful. I developed insomnia. I developed high blood pressure. I developed anxiety, all from just trying to carry the load on my own, not wanting people to really know the things that I was going through. There were many days that I remember sitting in my office literally in tears because there was so much pressure, so much stress sitting on my shoulders. But the minute someone came in or called me and asked me to do something, I'd suck it up and get right back to business because I just put on the face that everything was OK. But I was really, really hurting inside. It took a long time for me to realize that there is no harm in asking for help. There is no harm in saying that, hey, today is a bad day and I need somebody to be there to lean on and to support me. Um, this is why I take this so seriously in trying to be there to be that support system for other people. I used to hear my grandmother and my aunts and uncles say all the time that weeping and do it for a night, but joy came in the morning. And I never understood what that meant. I always thought that meant, 
okay, to bed, today's a bad day. I'm going to go to bed tonight, wake up in the morning, and there my joy will be. But when I equate that to caregiving, what I look at that is joy can be the small things. The weeping may be the hard part, the trying to deal with some of the difficulties that I'm facing in that moment. But those moments of clarity when she would recognize who I was, that was joy. Or those moments when I would come into the room and maybe say something, just being silly and a smile would come on her face, that was joy. So my word of encouragement to any caregiver that's going through would be seize those moments of joy, no matter how small they may be, no matter how randomly they may come, seize those moments of joy. Do the best you can with what you have. Don't worry about what other people are saying. Even if those around you are criticizing the job that you're doing, know that you are doing the very, very best that you can with what you have in that moment. And as long as you are true to yourself, as long as you know that your loved one is getting the very best care that they can get from you, then in the end, that's all that's going to really matter. And if you can lay yourself down at night, look yourself or look yourself in the mirror and know that you've done the very best that you can, then all is well. Um, I also had the privilege of serving as a facilitator in our Acts 2 program. So actually being able to guide caregivers through the program. And to me, that was a great blessing because I was able to share some of the things that I went through to kind of help them see that there is hope on the other side, to see that if I could be as vulnerable with them as that if I could be as vulnerable with them, then they could be vulnerable with me and we could share what we had gone through together and they would know that somebody literally understood what they had went through and was there to really, really support them. And everybody that I talk to, I tell them with me, there's a no judgment zone. I've been through a lot of things in my life. I have no room to judge anyone. So I am here just as a listening ear, as, as a word and as a person to be there to support them. So I thank you for listening to me and just learning a little bit more about who I am and why I do what I do and why I love what I do. And what I'm going to do now is just give you a little bit of information about our Acts 2 program. Um, Acts 2 is a free, and I stress free, faith-based skills training and support program for African-American caregivers of loved one with Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, we're often asked why African-American caregivers. The 12 session program is for African-American caregivers. Although anyone who needs assistance can call us and we will refer them to other resources that are available in the community. The 12 sessions are broken into groups and individual sessions. The seven group skills building sessions um, are delivered and the, the five individual sessions are delivered by a toll-free telephone system. So once again, there's no cost to participate. The groups are led by what we call lay pastoral care facilitators, which are basically lay persons from the churches who have either self-nominated or have been nominated by their judicatory leaders, and we have trained them to be able to deliver the sessions. In the individual sessions with the facilitators, they focus on any goals that the caregiver has set, whether they be personal goals or any caregiving related goals. For the contents of the program, there are six major components. There are the overview of the basic characteristics of dementia or what we call Dementia 101, and Dr. Glukoff will be giving us an example of Dementia 101 this evening. There's relaxation training combined with calming prayer and meditation. I will be doing a relaxation exercise with you this evening. There is effective thinking about the challenges of caregiving coupled with scripture. There's building in pleasant daily activities or what I call the me time module. Just being able to take 15 minutes to take a walk or listen to gospel music. There's communicating effectively with the care partner with dementia, with family or other healthcare professionals. Um, there's developing effect, effective problem solving skills through personal goal settings. And those are those five um, individual sessions that I spoke about in the end. Um, what we're gonna do now is take any questions that you may have about what our program offers before Dr. Glukoff begins his, his portion of Dementia 101.
Um, we have a question here that says, or a comment here that says, my sister and I are, bur are both learning about it from Miss Sherry. Thank you so much for sharing, Miss Sherry. Um, Miss Kelly says that the presentation looks amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm glad you like it. Hi, Ben. Wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Karina, you guys are so awesome. Thank you for what you do for our community. It is definitely our pleasure. Thank you for what you do. And we love you too. Any questions or additional comments about what we offer? Ben asked, is there a website that people can go to? Yes, we do have a website. Um, we will give that out in the end, and we're actually going to show a sample of that, and it's on your screen. It's www.x2project.org. Okay, Dr. Glukoff. Well, thank you, Tamika. I just wanted to say that uh, I was inspired by your your presentation, your personal personal testimony, and I I, I do agree that uh, the beauty of caregiving is in the small, recognizing those moments of clear communication of connection. That that's that's what it's all about. Of course, that's not unique to dementia. It's true of any relationship, but a, but especially so in caring for a loved one with dementia. As Tamika mentioned, I'm going to, uh, to do what we call Dementia 101. It's going to be a brief overview of, of the characteristics of, de of the dementias. We'll talk about this is really a cluster or a syndrome of conditions, not just one dementia, but we'll get to that later. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the key features of, uh, of progressive dementia, risk factors, warning signs of dementia, and probably the most inspiring part of Dementia 101 is what you can do to reduce the probability of, uh, of developing one of the dementias. So let's start with uh, the basic definition so that we're all on the same more or less the playing field. What, what is a dementia? Some, for some of you, this is too basic. For others, it, it may not be. Dementia is a general term for brain-related conditions or brain disorders that are associated with progressive loss of memory and, and other mental functions, such as just being able to organize your ideas. For a person to be diagnosed, let's flip back, please. For a, a person to be diagnosed with dementia, the memory, the difficulties with memory and other mental functions much, must be severe enough to interfere with the, the person's activities of daily living, interfering significantly with their capacity to carry out their activities and in uh, the way they used to, in a way that allows them to interact effect effectively with others. Next, please. Along with uh, loss of memory, which is one of the key criteria for the diagnosis of dementia, there are five other, other features or common symptoms associated with, uh, uh, with, uh, with dementia. One is language difficulties, not being able to express your ideas in a coherent, in a logical and understandable manner is a common symptom associated with, uh, with, with dementia. Another key problem is trouble taking care of yourself and, and, uh, and doing your chores. With the, as dementia progresses, as it develops, Persons with the condition have more difficulties with basic activities of daily living, such as putting on their clothing uh, in, in a way that they normally do in a coordinated fashion. Sometimes as the condition progresses, the care partner or caregiver will actually need to dress uh, the person with dementia. Having difficulties carrying out regular household chores may become a problem. For example, 
uh, putting your clothing into uh, the washing machine or uh, uh, mopping and uh, going through the routines associated with just cleaning the house become uh, can become a challenge and compromised by dementia. Using familiar objects incorrectly is an, another symptom or a common feature of dementia. Whereas your mother may normally have used a, a hairbrush to comb her hair, now she may be using a toothbrush. Of course, I don't have that particular difficulty if you've noticed already, so. Uh, uh, but at any rate, uh, that is a, a common concern, using uh, familiar objects incorrectly. Personality changes are, 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 are quite common, whereas your father, who was your go-to uh, support person and someone you could always rely on for assistance in, in a way that was calm and uh, easy to receive may now with the onset of dementia be unable to actually deal effectively with small changes in his routine where he was cool, calm, and collected before. Now he's become, he's becoming agitated and irritable with slight changes in routine. Another common uh, symptom associated with, uh, with dementia or another common feature is impaired judgment and uh, particularly social judgment and abstract reasoning. Whereas your mother was fastidious, was very careful about uh, managing her funds. She would do it every single week and do her checkbook. Now, with the onset of dementia, has gone to, to the bank and withdrawn large sums of money and then giving that money to vendors who knock on the door. That's, you know, obviously uh, uh, a significant uh, in, impairment of social judgment. I think I'll shift to types of dementia now. Yes, I'm sorry. Before we do that, let's take your questions. Any questions about what is dementia? Sherry, thank you for being so engaged in the, in the presentation. Sherry writes, how can we slow the progress of, of dementia in our, lo in, our, in our loved ones? Is it possible? Well, it, it is possible. Uh, uh, it, there's no guarantee there, uh, Miss Hillary, but the, we're going to be talking about how to, to lower the probability of developing dementia for those who uh, say are in the, before they develop the condition of the, in, their, in, in, in middle adulthood, by encouraging your loved ones to be physically active, to, to have uh, to, a, a diet that uh, may be more uh, uh, that would consist more of leafy vegetables and 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 foods that are not uh, high do not contain a large amount of uh, of saturated fats like you would see with red meat. Those kinds of changes have been associated with in certain studies a a, a lowering of the the downhill progression of dementia. Thank you for your question. All right, let's move back one slide, please. Sorry. You can go ahead and show that one. I think I'm gonna hold back on that. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about the functional progression of, uh, of, of dementia. In this, in this case, it's Alzheimer's disease. If you look on this graph on the top left-hand corner, you'll see those activities in the early stages of the condition that are likely to be affected by dementia such as keeping appointments, even using a telephone to be able to pick it up, plug a, a button, be able to take turns 
with the person who's on the other end of the of the line in conversations those are activities that can be impaired in the early stages of the condition then as we move toward the middle stages sometimes there are significant difficulties with using appliances selecting and putting on clothing and as the as the middle stage of the condition progresses even with grooming and um, and bathing and with just regular hygiene and unfortunately as the progression progression uh, of the of the symptoms worsens symptoms of dementia uh, loved ones with dementia may not be able to to walk they may need a uh, a, a wheelchair uh, to 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 use for transportation around the house and sometimes as the condition progresses persons are no longer able to eat or have difficulty swallowing let's shift to the types of dementia dementia as i mentioned earlier is really a mislabeling of the term there are actually dementias but what you might want to think about is dementia is kind of like a is more or less like a a large umbrella term and underneath that umbrella are smaller umbrellas that are the specific types of dementia and the most frequent the most common type of dementia is Alzheimer's disease, and that comprises 65% folks of, of all dementia. So you wouldn't be inaccurate to say, well, my, my wife or my husband or, or my mother has, has Alzheimer's disease. Uh, if you're thinking, even if you didn't know the exact diagnosis, because that really is the most common form of dementia. But there are other types of, uh, of, of dementias as well. Before I move on to those types, let me share with you the, the characteristics briefly of Alzheimer's disease, what makes up that condition, what cause or what's believed to cause Alzheimer's disease, that particular type, are what are called plaques. They're fatty deposits in the brain. And... Uh, those fatty deposits lead to, as they accumulate, the death of of, of nerve fibers, of ne so-called neurons in the brain that lead to problems with memory and other types of activities of daily living. Another type of, uh, of problem that occurs in the brain with Alzheimer's is the, what are called tangles, or those tangles in the actual nerve fibers lead to problems of of the channeling of nerve impulses from one neuron or one nerve fiber to the next and ultimately can cause problems with with memory or judgment or uh, other forms of activities of daily living the next most common type of dementia is what is called vascular dementia and that that is results from uh, from the breakdown of blood vessels in the brain. You could have either little bleeds or, or, or blood clots that, that lead to the, to the loss of blood getting to, to nerve fibers in the brain. The, uh, the most common problem associated with vascular dementia and that what underlies it is high blood pressure, smoking, Uh, overweight, those particular factors contribute to the development of vascular dementia. It was previously called multi-infarct or stroke dementia, stroke-related dementia. There are other forms of dementia uh, due to time constraints. I won't go into them, but uh, they're called, there's Lewy bodies, dementia with Lewy bodies. And, and you can have dementia associated with Parkinson's disease, as well as with Down syndrome. In fact, up to 50% of persons with Down syndrome after the age of, of, of 60 have some form of dementia. I'm going to pause here for questions.
Thank you, Ms. Garcon, for the difference. The question is, what is the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Alzheimer's is a type of dementia. It is a type of dementia. As I said before, it composes 65% of all persons with dementia. But dementia is that large umbrella term that covers the wide variety of specific conditions, Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, dementia associated with Parkinsonism, and dementia, as I discussed previously, associated with Down syndrome. Other questions? Now we have a question from Ms. Pierce Lackey. Are there vitamins that help to slow dementia? Uh, good question. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, there, are, there have been a number of vitamins and other what are called nutraceuticals that have been have reported, have been reported to, to assist someone with uh, uh, to reduce or slow down the, the development of dementia. For the most part, those vitamins have not been shown to be effective in slowing dementia. There are some key vitamins that people need to have just in their lives, like B12, that need to be part of the diet and can lead to dementia. But your question is, are there vitamins that have been shown to be effective once someone has dementia to slow the progression, at least from the studies which I've been exposed to, the answer is no, unfortunately. Well, we have a very uh, intelligent audience. They're asking all these important questions here. Is this dementia genetic? There is a genetic component associated with dementia. We're gonna go over that a little bit, but I'll just answer it briefly, Ms. Monroe, to. Uh, to honor your question, there are uh, persons who have um, mothers and fathers or siblings with dementia are more likely to develop the condition. And there are certain genes that dispose folks that make it more likely called, as one gene, APOE4, if you have two, uh, uh, they're called alleles, two representations of that particular gene, you're more likely, that APOE4 gene, you're more likely to develop uh, dementia. However, and I'm going to get to this later big time, what accounts for most of the variation of whether someone gets dementia or doesn't, th those factors are so-called modifiable factors, and they're associated with lifestyle, what we eat, how much exercise we have, how much stimulation, et cetera. How often do you think, this is from Miss Edwards. Yes, of course. How often do you think people are misdiagnosed or diagnosed too early with dementia? Uh, I think misdiagnosis is quite common uh, with dementia, uh, especially if, the person who's reporting it is unable to express their symptoms in a way that makes sense to a the 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 provider which sometimes may be difficult i mean you know just in communicating effectively with with physicians and other healthcare providers at times is challenging so if you don't give them you know the the common memory problem or or talk about difficulties being able to carry out activities. Yes, it could be misdiagnosed. I'm unfamiliar with it being diagnosed too early, but it's more the misdiagnosis or the lack of diagnosis that creates the problem. Miss Hillary, is the plaque that causes Alzheimer's natural or is it a result of something else? It's the uh, Miss Hillary, once again, excellent question. Uh, there are natural fatty substances in, in, in the body and in the brain. However, it's the accumulation of plaques called amyloid plaques, those fatty deposits that typically contain uh, uh, low density or 
bad cholesterol that cause uh, ultimately the problem of, of nerve fibers in the brain uh, uh, dying. Uh, so it's usually associated with what we eat or our, uh, and in some ways uh, how we metabolize uh, our foods. If we don't get enough exercise and the, the body accumulates fat, you can, it, it may lead to, to increased probability of, of Alzheimer's. I think at this point we should move on because we have a lot, lot to cover. Thank you for your questions. Love this audience, by the way. Wow. Now I'm going to, to shift the, uh, the discussion to the warning signs of dementia. What I call them the red flags, so to speak, red flags of dementia. Knowing the red flags of dementia are important, folks, but also I would say equally important is to know what is normal forgetting. We don't want people coming out of this workshop today uh, wondering, well, do I have dementia when it's really what their experience is, is normal forgetting? By the way, this happens not uncommonly. So we punctuate this point. It's important to know what's normal forgetting. At any rate, I'm going to highlight three red flags or three warning signs and couple them with normal forgetting for persons who are 60 years of age and older. Well, the first is memory of uh, loss that disrupts daily life. Here's a red flag. If Rob, yours truly, was to forget his birth date, that would be a red flag, a warning sign of dementia. Even worse is if he were to forget the birth date of his wife. So that's a red flag, a red flag. However, however, if, if you were in a meeting, and uh, met a couple and got to know their names. And you spent like an hour uh, at that meeting with them and later saw them in the grocery store and couldn't remember their names. Normal forgetting folks for those over, over the age of 60, that's normal. Okay, we'll move to number two, challenges in planning or solving problems. Okay. Let's assume that your mom, and maybe some of you have had this, uh, the, this experience of your mom making her favorite pie. Let's say it's an apple pie. And she made it for you and for other family members, and it was a famous apple pie. Someone that, it's something that folks really love. She did it regularly. If she were no longer able to know how to put the apples in the, spices together and you know the to put in that brown sugar over the the apples red flag folks that's a red flag for a warning sign of dementia after all uh not only were her pies famous but she did it pretty regularly okay however if you had a recipe and it was a new recipe one you hadn't used before and you read over it carefully and then as you were doing it, you forgot to include an important ingredient in that recipe when it came out and people were eating it. Maybe they wouldn't be aware of it, maybe you. That, that's normal forgetting, that's normal forgetting, folks. So let's move on to the, the third uh, warning sign. New, this, this relates to new problems with words or in, in speaking or writing. And I'm going to focus on conversation. I'll use myself as an example. If in the middle of this presentation, I wasn't able to recall what I'm going to talk about next in the conversation here, if I wasn't able to remember what I had talked about previously, Red flag for Rob, that may be a warning sign of dementia for him. However, if, if I wasn't able to remember the right word for a, a particular condition or a right word for 
a, a potential complication with dementia. And it just didn't come to mind for me. That's, that's normal forgetting. Well, I hope that was helpful, folks, and we'll move on to questions. Miss Sherry Hillary says, yes, I've had to answer the same questions from my aunt several times throughout uh, out throughout the day that that if that were to happen and if she wasn't a, a person with dementia, uh, that that might be a, a warning sign or a red flag. Of course, it doesn't mean that she ne necessarily has dementia, but that would be something that would uh, be put a flag up to which you might want to pay attention, Miss Hillary. Next question, please. Miss Monroe, what are your thoughts on the Blue Zone diet for dementia prevention? I, I have to admit my ignorance, Miss Monroe. Uh, maybe you can, re in the comments here, just refer us to that Blue Zone diet. I'm not familiar with it. Please forgive me. Okay, let's shift to so some the the reported risk factors associated uh, with the dementias. The most common risk factor associated with dementia is aging, and if you look on the graph, you'll see on the bottom the percent of persons with Alzheimer's is fairly low between ages 65 to 74. That's approximately, uh, I would say, five to 10% of persons uh, uh, that are in that age group who may have dementia. But as the graph moves uh, from left to right, you see that the as the person ages, as we age, the probability of developing dementia increases significantly up to the point that somewhere in the range of 40% of all persons who are 85 years of age or older in this country have some form of diagnosable dementia. And just shifting to other risk factors, older age is 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 as i said the most the strongest predictor for developing dementia and older age is a part of a set of factors that are not modifiable we can't change our age at least i haven't been able to myself that's a given it's not modifiable your family history of dementia that's not modifiable, folks. Your genetic makeup is not modifiable. So there are risk factors that are not modifiable, not changeable, and there are risk factors that are changeable, so-called modifiable ones. And we'll go over those because those are the ones you can about which you can do something by taking different actions. We'll get into that in, in a moment. Type 2 diabetes is a modifiable risk factor. It can be modified by how much you exercise, your diet, etc. How much you weigh, being overweight, is something that most of us can modify. How much blood, how high your blood pressure is, is a modifiable factor for the most part. Lack of physical exercise, well, that's, for most of, it's, uh, of us, it's modifiable. Not having sufficient intellectual stimulation and activities, that can be modified. And even the probability, folks, of developing brain injuries can be reduced, especially those uh, injuries that may be related to falls or even through the types of sports in which we participate. We do have choices about how much we expose ourselves 
to brain injury. Wearing seat belts while you're driving a car. That's something we could, for most of us, we can control. So those are the reported risk factors. And I will pause for questions. Mental or physical exercise can help to prevent. Yes, definitely. And we're going to cover that, Ms. Garcon, in just one moment. But let me answer yes to that big time, especially physical exercise, which is probably the most powerful approach in reducing the likelihood of developing dementia. I'll give you the more, more of the specifics in, uh, when we get to the next slide. Ms. Kelly Fuller. She asked, does PTSD or someone who served in a war have a higher susceptibility to developing dementia? Very good question. If those persons, Kelly, had head injuries, concussions, or war-related injuries that affected the brain, they may have a higher probability of developing dementia. Dementia has age. Well, we know that, I'm, I'm gonna interpret that to mean, is dementia associated with age? And the answer is yes. As we get older, uh, we're more likely to develop dementia. And I said, and I maybe I need to talk about not the, gr the glass, uh, uh, that's full on the dementia side, but let's talk about the empty side of dementia as well. 85% of persons, so, I'm sorry, 40% of persons with dementia who are 85 years of age or older are likely to develop or already have dementia. However, 60% of those 85 year, year olds and older do not have dementia. So it's not normal aging. It's not normal aging to, to, to have dementia. In fact, it's the minority of older persons age 85 or older that is who have dementia. So that's a good news. Thank you for asking that question, Ms. Garcon. Okay. So here's the good news, folks. We're going to end on a on a top note here, and then we're going to have Tamika move on to our relaxation and calming prayer. What can you do to prevent the development of the dementias, and particularly Alzheimer's and vascular dementia, which represent the most frequent types of dementia? As I had mentioned earlier, getting moderate to vigorous exercise, being able to to get moderate levels of exercise, uh, ideally five days a week, that is for 20 minutes a shot or three days a week for a larger amount of time for 50 minutes a shot can reduce significantly the likelihood of developing the dementias or one of the dementias. A significant 30, 50% of sometimes there have been studies that persons who engage in moderate to, to vigorous forms of exercise can uh, prevent or slow down the probability of developing dementia earlier in late adulthood. Eating leafy vegetables, the so-called DASH diet or the modified DASH, D-A-S-H diet, the Mediterranean diet associated with eating fruits, leafy vegetables, whole grains, lowering the intake of sugar and saturated fats. Those are also uh, keys to reducing the probability of dementia. What we mean by saturated fats, the typical type of saturated fats are red meats that have that are uh, associated with a lot of uh, of fat surrounding them. Those are uh, the saturated fats. Just reducing the amount of 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 red meats that we eat that have quite a bit of fat associated with them will help. And reducing sugar intake. 
We also know that relaxation training and meditation may lower the risk of Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. However, the, the factor that accounts for, or the type of, of preventive strategy that accounts for the biggest effects, the biggest bang for, for your hour of effort is in getting physical exercise. However, if coupled with prayer and coupled with meditation, then you get you get a twofer, folks. You can increase the probability probability a little bit higher. Let me just end by saying that social connections, keeping socially active, has been shown to be associated with reduced probabilities of developing dementia. And keeping mentally active that doesn't mean necessarily having to have video games in the house. It could be uh, working at your church and doing some problem solvings and uh, problem solving sessions with others in uh, in the community who are trying to to develop services that are needed by the congregation. Those kind of problem solving uh, efforts that are done on a regular basis in the faith community can be helpful in maintaining your your mental acuity and and keep you sharp intellectually. I've already mentioned uh, car safety, using safety belts, uh, and also another important piece is fall proofing, trying to eliminate uh, loose rugs or, or uh, uh, opportunities that may result from stepping down from one portion of the house to the other opportunities for falls, trying to in decrease the likelihood that some that an older adult might trip and fall and have a head injury uh, are also methods for preventing the uh, the development of the dementias. And I will end there and turn it over to Tamika Norton Brown. Thank you, Dr. G. Um, and we're going to take a minute now to answer any questions about that last portion um, that you just Thank covered. You, you're welcome. So, if you have any questions? Okay, Miss Monroe says, "Do we have any tips for long distance caregiving?" Hmm. I'll let you answer that, Miss T. Miss <laughs> Monroe, I was a long distance caregiver. Um, the only tip that I can give, or what I did, I basically traveled every weekend um, just to kind of make sure that things were in order. Um, Looking back on it, what I wish I would have done was not panic every time the telephone rang because because I was not there, I would kind of panic every time I saw the number come up on the caller ID. Um, if you have someone in the area, whether it be another family member, um, a close friend or somebody who can drop by and kind of give you updates um, on what's going on, that's a tip that I would give. Um, just kind of making sure that you're at stay as involved as you can but don't get yourself so caught up in it at one i was so caught up until i literally left work many many days um in tears because i didn't know what was going on i would just get a phone call and would just drop everything and leave but if there's someone you can trust um in the neighborhood whether it be an older person down the street, or like I said, a family member who can just kind of drop in for you um, and kind of keep you updated on what's going on, then, then I would try doing that as well. Um, any additional questions? I, before, I just want to address one question before we get started. I'll make this brief. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Milton, asked uh, Stephanie Milton, she's a caregiver and her clients are Caucasian. Um, she, she's uh, not a Caucasian. One thing that you should be aware of uh, and is that African Americans are two times more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease and two and a half times more likely to develop vascular dementia than their Caucasian counterparts, the majority population, unfortunately. And we can talk a little bit more, Ms. Milton, about what contributes to that uh, when we're gonna be shifting to our general question and answer period after Tamika finishes. So we will readdress this question, Ms. Milton, and please bring it up again uh, for uh, further elaboration. 
Um, what we wanted to be able to do was to give you all a sample of one of the relaxation techniques that we use with our caregivers. Um, if you're anything like me, I used to think that relaxing was just going home, getting in the recliner, and woosa, there it is, I'm relaxed. Um, what I came to learn is that there's an entire technique built in around relaxation. So what I'd like for you all to do is to just make sure that you're comfortable. Um, make sure that you are, that you're seated comfortably and we're gonna go through this relaxation exercise. Um, the first thing to know is that when getting started, um, it's often helpful to scan your body to learn where you feel your stress or tension. Um, I want you to focus on the way that your body feels. Where in your body do you store your tension? And I want you to slowly and quietly begin to scan your body with your mind to determine where you're feeling the most tension. And this place could be anywhere at any given time as you go through the process and it could also change. Um, a list of the most common areas of the body where tension are stored are your toes, your feet, your calves, your knees, your thighs, the front and back, low and high, your buttocks, your lower back, your upper back, your neck and shoulders, which is where I carry mine, your upper arms, your lower arms, your hands, your head your forehead, your eyes, and your jaw. So those are just some of the areas in your body where you can store your tension. So before we go into this exercise, like I said before, I want you to make sure that you're seated comfortably with your legs uncrossed, and I want you to make sure that your feet are flat on the floor. Sit with good back support, rest your arms comfortably, even if you just have to rest them on your legs. And I want you to begin to breathe in and out deeply and slowly. Allow your mind and your body to begin to feel the relaxation. Remember as you're breathing to breathe so that you're feeling your lungs from the bottom to the top. So now I want you to take five so slow breaths on a count of four. So breath number one, I want you to inhale slowly, count of four, and exhale. Breath number two, inhale deeply, remember to feel your lungs from the bottom, and exhale. Breath number three, slowly and deeply. and exhale. Breath number four. Feel your lungs from the bottom. Inhale, slowly, deeply, exhale. Breath number five. And as you're inhaling on breath number five, I want you to give yourself permission to quiet your mind and relax and exhale. I want you to close your eyes, continue to breathe deeply and slowly, and begin to slowly and smoothly let go. I want you to release any tension in your neck, your shoulders, your arms, your back, and your feet. Breathing slowly and deeply, I want you to silently repeat the phrases that I'm going to say to you. I feel quiet. I am beginning to feel relaxed. My feet are heavy. My feet are relaxed. My feet are comfortable. My ankles are heavy.
my ankles are relaxed. My ankles are comfortable. My knees are heavy. My knees are relaxed. My knees are comfortable. Warmth is flowing into my hands. My hips feel heavy. My hips feel relaxed. My hips feel comfortable. The whole middle part of my body feels quiet and relaxed. My hands feel heavy. My hands feel relaxed. My hands feel comfortable. My arms feel heavy. My arms feel relaxed. My arms feel comfortable. My shoulders feel heavy. My shoulders feel relaxed. My shoulders feel comfortable. My neck feels relaxed. My jaw feels relaxed. My forehead feels relaxed. My forehead feels comfortable and smooth. My entire body feels quiet, comfortable, and relaxed. My arms are heavy. My arms are warm. My hands are heavy. My hands are warm. I feel quiet. My arms are relaxed, relaxed and warm. My hands are warm. My hands are warm and relaxed. Now
Now I want you to take a deep breath, exhale slowly, and return your focus back to the room. That is just a sample of a relaxation exercise that we conduct in our 12 session program. Um, hopefully it has provided some relaxation um, for you this evening. What we're now go going to do is to give you information on dementia care resources that are available um, in our area. This information is included in the packet of information. Um, we have the Alzheimer's Association, the Alzheimer's Foundation of America, the Florida Department of Elder Affairs, the Elder Helpline, the Elder Care Locator, and the Alzheimer's Disease Education and Referral Center. Um, many will ask, how do we contact the X2 project? Um, there are many ways to contact us. We, you can contact us by telephone, email, or through the web. We have a toll-free number. That number is 1-866-778-2724. The local number, 850-274-4945, which is my cell phone number. Um, the toll-free number also comes to my cell phone number. Um, my email address, tnnorton at fsu.edu. You can also come here to our Facebook page, leave messages. We do try to respond um, in a timely manner. Um, and we also have a website, www.x2project.org. And what we're going to do is bring it up just so you can see what our website looks like. Um, many interesting things on our website. We have links on our website. This links to some of those resources um, that I mentioned to you before and other resources that are available. So it is very useful as well. Um, we also have a tab called Caregiver Resources. Um, we are continuously updating this page and updating um, and adding resources to this page um, as well. And then we also have a sign up button. You can go here, um, any information that you enter on this, whether you want to sign up for um, the sessions, if you have a question, you can fill your information in there. And once you submit it, that comes to my email as well. Um, so there are multiple ways to get in touch with us. And as I said before, we do try to respond um, as quickly as we can. Um, so we appreciate you all reaching out to us. Um, what we want to do is to take um, a little bit of time to answer any additional questions um, that you all may have for us about anything that we've talked about during the presentation, anything about the program, um, any general questions um, that you may have. So let's take any questions, comments. Okay, Ms. Sherry Hillary says, what do you suggest for maintaining social and mental activity activity during the pandemic? My aunt is high risk for COVID-19 and I'm worried about her spending too much time outside. Dr. G, do you want to take that one? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, let me just suggest uh, a few things. Um, you know, uh, these and, and Miss Hillary, since I can't really interact with you in real time, I apologize for that if I'm sharing uh, items that you may already be doing. But here are some general ones that then might be uh, might be considered. Maybe you and your loved one with dementia can be very creative during this time of COVID-19, spending a lot of time at home. Uh, Maybe even being able to collect favorite songs from the past. And uh, you, you don't have to, I don't know if some of you listen to those late night programs that are selling you uh, DVDs and CDs of, of uh, a variety of soul music and hip hop or whatever it might be. Uh, uh, you can actually, you know, 
create your own little collection with your loved one with dementia of soul songs, soul music, R&B, and have you know a creative time of doing that. And that could be a lot of fun. Also, uh, maybe even uh, if you if you haven't done this already, creating a photo album together, shots of photos of of you and your dad, or you and your mom. Say it's your your mom who's the, the, the person with dementia, her friends, high school uh, classmates. You can really get very creative. In fact, if you want, you could. And I'm not sure how this, you know, would work with your particular loved one. Maybe saying, well, we're going to create a, a something different tonight for dinner and we're going to put it together. And and uh, I will, you know, it, you know, do the cooking, but you help me to select what we're going to do. Some so creative activities, uh, out of the box activities that you can can do together and and really develop even a stronger connection possibly during this difficult time. Tamika, do you have any thoughts about this question? Um, and I would say some of the same activities that you would do with kids, painting, um, getting paint kits, coloring, word puzzles. Um, there's a lady from my church. She likes to do the word puzzles. So she calls me every day if she's stuck on a word we sit there and we try to unscramble the word. So anything, like he said, get creative. Um, some of the same activities as I was saying that you would do with kids are just busy work. Anything that can kind of keep them busy, keep, keep them occupied, keep it interesting would be my suggestion. Okay. Ms. Garzon asked, um, medication treatment for dementia. Do you want me to take that to you or yeah. do you want to do it? You can do that one. Okay. Uh, this is an area, unfortunately, Ms. Garcon, you've asked some very good questions. Thank you. Um, this has been an area of disappointment in, in, uh, for uh, persons uh, with dementia, their loved ones, and maybe even for the community that develops medications. Medications, which I guess are called memory enhancers, uh, that uh, have been developed over the years uh, really have not been particularly effective uh, for enhancing the memory and other types of intellectual functioning and activities of daily living of persons with dementia. Uh, I think there's hope for the future that there are some very important developments that are happening in this area. However, most of what we've been had, that's been developed uh, over the the last several several decades has not been particularly helpful in in improving the memory and mental functions of persons with dementia. You're probably familiar with the usual suspects: Aricept, uh, Mamantine. Uh, you may see changes for a couple years, but uh, but they're not changes that are necessarily going to last over time. Some folks do report some short-term changes that are effective, and everyone has to kind of figure out the cost-benefit, not only in terms of dollars, but in terms of side effects for loved ones with dementia. Sometimes you have GI, gastrointestinal uh, problems, but there are some uh, some folks do report short-term benefits from the medication, and it may be something you would might want to explore with your physician. Miss Milton says, "I'm a caregiver. Most of my client my clients are white with Alzheimer's and dementia, so I'm confused about who has it." You want me to pick this up to you, or do you want to do it? Um, I think as Dr. G said earlier that um, African Americans um, are diagnosed or do have a more prevalent um, have more prevalent cases of it. There are, I think, sometimes there's confusion between 
is it only Caucasians that get it or is there only African Americans that get it? We're more, more prone um, simply because of our diet, simply because of some of the stresses that we go through, the high blood pressure um, and the, some of the lifestyle um decisions or the lifestyle situations that we're under so it shows up um within our community more prevalently than it does in other communities anything you wanted to add to that dr g before we yeah. went on? yeah hold on a second i got switched on to another thing okay here i'm back um Ms. Milton, uh, one thing that should be aware of, you were looked, if you were to look at the numbers of people across the U.S. that have dementia, uh, there are more uh, co white people who have dementia than, pers than persons of color because most of the population is Caucasian. Now, that will change over time. But if you look at the, if you just looked at, given the number of people of, uh, who have dementia per 100,000 in the population, proportionately speaking, the rate of dementia is higher in African Americans and in persons of color than, than, than Caucasians. But in terms of the absolute number of people who have it in the country, there are more whites who, white persons who have it than, than persons of color. I hope that's helpful. Um, Ms. Lackey says, how much does stress and depression attribute mm -hmm. to dementia? Rob, you can take that one. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think this is a really important question. Uh, and I, I think, you, is there a direct relationship between depression and dementia? No. Is there a direct relationship between living in stressful circumstances and developing dementia? Uh, no, however, there is a path that you should be aware of, especially in the development of vascular or blood, brain blood vessel related dementia. For persons who are experiencing a high degree of stress, they may be highly anxious and depressed. That may lead to greater levels of high blood pressure. So persons who are undergoing chronic strain economically uh, due, due to the untoward effects of racism in this country and other factors in the environment, as that con has continued to build in the US, there are heightened levels of hypertension or high blood pressure and in turn, a greater likelihood for vascular dementia that is strongly associated with high blood pressure. I hope that that answers your question. Um, <laughs> Michael Brewer asks, how long should intellectual stimulation activities last? and how often should they occur? Um, my opinion on that is they should last as long as they can tolerate it and as often as they will allow you um, to do it. Um, I know we used to try to do um, word puzzles, listening to music and those type thing. I would do it until she got aggravated and, and told me to turn it <laughs> off. Um, so my short answer to that is, as long as they're able to tolerate it and they're um, being acceptable of it, um, and as often as they're willing to do it, I would say go with that. I don't think, my opinion, I don't think there's any cookie cutter answer to that because everybody's different. Um, you have some loved ones who will sit there for hours and do word puzzles for hours. Um, and be okay with that. And you have some who after five minutes, they've had enough of it. So I think it just depends. Dominique Maddox asks, do you know of any tips caregivers can employ for a loved one who refuses to shower, bath, and are physically stronger and at times confrontational? Mm -hmm. 
Dr. Drew, you can take that one. Yeah, this is a com Dominique, thank you for bringing this question to the table, so to speak. Uh, there, there are many ways to deal with this problem. It is a common issue, as I mentioned before, that one of the, the problems associated with dementia, especially as the condition progresses, is uh, that the loved one may not uh, in, uh, choose to bathe, may refuse to bathe, and that, that problem becomes uh, 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 compounded when someone is physically stronger than you, and, 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 in their, and especially if they're confrontational. I think the most important pieces to consider there is to be aware of, of opportunities to make the shower or bathing enjoyable. So making sure that, uh, that your loved one uh, is in, a, in, of course, in a safe environment, but also maybe a, a little bit of music, gentle music uh, associated with the showering. Maybe even saying, you know, you know, after you do your bath, dear, we're going to have your your special uh, a special dinner for you, a little special snack, so a little bit of a reward. I wouldn't mind that myself. I don't know about you. That that doesn't happen to me very frequently. That that might get me going to bathe more often. Uh, Making. <laughs> Sometimes even, and, and for some people, this might be harder than others. Actually, say if you're you're doing some uh, bathing that uh, may be in the shower, getting in the shower together, and showing your and you bathing yourself, Dominique, and and this has to work for you. This is not for everyone. And actually showing your loved one that you're doing the bathing, and then they can model you as you uh wash your hair your loved one with dementia will wash her hair so that's the kind of thinking that um, is required and and if you wish dominique we can give you information uh uh if you've uh if you want just go to that contact form that tamika was talking about on our website ask your question or you can call us uh, on our toll-free number, and we'll respond to you directly for your specific concerns around this, because I've oversimplified it greatly. You, the the, res the response, but I hope that that gets the the thoughts percolating up for you about what you can do. Raven says, "Are memory care centers effective in slowing down the progression of dementia?" Um, memory care centers in terms of day stays, I think they do a wonderful job in giving giving the um, the loved ones or you know a, a safe place to go um, and doing activities with them. As Dr. G was saying earlier, um, one of the prevention st strategies is to do things that will kind of, I call it keeping the cylinders firing. So they do a great job of giving them things that will help keep their mind constantly stimulated, keep them focused um, on other things, keeping those skills sharp. So in that aspect, yes, I think that they do have um, a lot to offer in providing those types of services. Anything you want to add to that, Dr. G? No, I think that you covered it well. That we, as we talked about before, intellectual and social stimulation uh, that may come from. I'm, I'm not sure if you're referring, uh, Miss Baston, to memory care units or memory uh, or 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 centers where the memory care uh, activities are being carried out. But let's assume it's memory care units. I think Tamika's right on target. At least you could say that probably you may be able to to lower the likelihood of de further decline than maybe improving memory but yes i think that's that's the, what tamika said is right on target okay um miss johnny lee says i am currently sitting with a client with dementia since october 
Before COVID-19, we could socialize a lot with her community. Since COVID-19, we have looked at her paintings, play cards, bingo. I also read to her and we take books from the library so that she may look at pictures. She traveled a lot and there's familiarity looking at photos. Keeping your loved one or client busy is very helpful. Explain current conditions and be safe. That's mm -hmm. great advice um, that you're giving, Miss Johnny. And that's great for those who are looking for activities, as Dr. G was saying earlier, things that can be done um, during this COVID-19 time that we're in right now. So thank you for sharing that. Ms. Gilly says, very informative. Thank you so much. That was our goal. We wanted to bring informative, useful information um, to everyone to be, you know, timely and to have stuff that can be used um, during this time. Ms. Garzon asks, do we serve only African-Americans? Yes, for our 12 session caregiver program, it is for African-American caregivers of loved ones with Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, but as I stated earlier, if non-African-Americans if non um, have concerns or need referrals, they can also call me and I will make referrals to other resources that are available in the community in their area. Yes. I also, can I add one point too, Tamika, just to, to, yes. to, to, you know, you can call on our toll free telephone line or write us and it, we're, we're very happy whether you're, you know, uh, Caucasian or if you're, you know, a person of color, but not African American, we will be available to problem solve with you online and to refer you to resources. The 12 session program as Tamika uh, indicated was developed for African Americans because what we know is that African Americans are significantly more likely to develop dementia than others and also African American caregivers are faced with significant problems that others face but maybe even more so in terms of financial considerations and being at risk. I'm talking about caregivers now. African-American caregivers are substantially more likely to develop new hyper, high blood pressure or cardiovascular problems, heart disorders than other groups. So what we've tried to do is to meet the, the need, the gap in services that are tailored and culturally responsive to African Americans are small in number. And Acts 2 was that the, the, the thrust for developing this program was to shore up that gap so that we could bridge the gap for, for African Americans who may not choose to receive services or do not have access to services because they don't take into account many programs the traditions and and the 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 cultural uh individual cultural characteristics of of african americans so we're trying to to meet a need that is uh that has not been addressed in the past by most healthcare systems that provide care to or support for Africa for 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 caregivers broadly conceived and and I hope that addresses that your that your question Miss Garcon because that's a very good one. Um, Connie Corker says excellent presentation, great questions and answers. Thank you so much for being here, Miss Connie. Miss Hillary says, thank you both for answering all my questions. I enjoyed this workshop a lot. And thank you so much, Miss Hillary, for taking the time to join us. And if you have any additional questions um, that you may have, you can always, as um, Dr. Glukov said, call um, or email, and we will gladly answer any additional questions that you may have. Oh, well, thank Ms. you, Miss Garcon, for your, uh, for your comments. That's, that's very uh, thoughtful of you. 
you said that it was very educational and you thanked us. One thing that I wanted to share with you, and uh, I know that we're, we've gone beyond the hour and 15 minutes, but we have a very enthusiastic group. We don't want to cut you short. I wanted to emphasize, and I know that uh, Tamika will as well, that this is just the beginning, the beginning of our live Facebook outreach. And we are planning to develop several workshops and presentations that address very important themes like planning for the future, estate planning for your loved one with dementia so that she or he doesn't lose all their hard earned resources such as the home that they've owned because they need to give those up if they've not prepared effectively through estate planning, having the protective documents so that uh, if your loved one with dementia needs to go on Medicaid, that your the home of your loved one with dementia is not taken away from them because they've been on Medicaid. So we will be addressing estate planning. We're gonna talk, we're gonna have a special panel on COVID-19. Some of you have already uh, brought that to the table. We are going to have a panel uh, that uh, addresses adult daycare and other resources in the community. So we're gonna bring it by God's grace, folks, on a regular basis. We do in-person presentations normally, but at this point in time during the pandemic, we're gonna come out strongly and on a regular basis serve the community. And in the future, past COVID-19, we're going to do a mix of in-person presentations and a live Facebook with our the help of uh, Chrissy Souders, who's in the background here, and uh, Melissa Powell and others who are supporting this production today. And we thank them, Chrissy and Melissa, for your help. Yeah, and we want to um, finally thank all of you for joining us. Um, this live will stay up on our Facebook page. There will be a link to the um, presentation, um, to the PowerPoint presentation will be embedded as well in the comments. Um, feel free to continue to comment. Feel free to share it with anyone who wasn't able to make it, but who you think might benefit from it. Um, like I said before, if you have additional questions um, for us, please reach out. Um, if you're interested in signing up for our 12 session program, um, you can do that on the website as well. Send me an email. Um, give me a call on um, whatever. And we really appreciate you all taking time out of your busy schedule this evening um, to join us for this workshop. And thank you so much. Um, go to our um, website, www.x2project.org um, for additional information and resources. And have a great evening. Tamika, before you get off, can you, or we get off, can you tell them what if they weren't, they came in late? Uh, to the, the presentation, how will they be able to get the PowerPoint uh, copies if they chose to? Um, and the actual, what they're going to do is the live is going to be up. There will be a link in the comments that um, for the actual presentation. And in the description, there will be a link um, for the actual presentation as well. So we will make sure that it is listed in the description, that it is in the comments, so they will have access to the actual presentation. And there will be a video copy of this available too. Am I right, uh, Ms. T? Yes, this live stream will be up. So as I was saying before, um, continue to comment on it. We will respond to comments, share it um, with anyone who you think may be interested. Um, for our Acts 2 program, we cover an area from Tampa to Pensacola. So anyone who you think that may be interested, um, this information can go statewide. So anyone throughout the state of Florida who you think that you, you know, hey, this is some good information you may be interested in, please share it with them. And we greatly appreciate that. We know that right now we don't have access to get to you all. So we're going to socially distance and virtually come to you all. So we would appreciate any help um, that you all could provide in disseminating the information.
And once again, we thank you all so very much and have a wonderful evening. We love you folks. Thank you.